My name is Donna Jean Wood. I am retired for seven years now from the David Wilson Chair in Business Ethics at the University of Northern Iowa. Before that, I was 22 years at the University of Pittsburgh Business School with a couple of semesters uh, to play around at the Darden School at Un University of Virginia, which was big fun. Um, uh, uh, Pat has asked me to say what I'm working on now. Um, I can say that uh, just finished uh, a fairly sizable paper on uh, a 20-year retrospective and prospective of the stakeholder salience paper I did with Ron Mitchell and Brad Agel, and I'll have more to say about that in a little bit. Um, and also uh, just finished a, a piece, a shorter piece with Barry Mitnick and Dwayne Windsor about, um, well, it's sort of a critique of um, a couple of things that just appeared in the Academy of Management Review in January, so we probably ought not to say more about that. Um, I uh, thought you might be interested to know how I came into the field of business and society. I started there and not in business ethics per se. Uh, it was pretty much outrage plus serendipity that, that brought me into the field. In 1978, as I was finishing my dissertation and about to graduate, I also uh, gave birth to my first kid and read the, the, uh, the first First book, uh, a, a book called Suffer the Children, the Story of Thalidomide, which was produced by the Insight team of the Sunday Times of London when that was a real newspaper. Um, they had been tracking the story of thalidomide for some 20 plus years at that point. Um, and <clears throat> it was a story that was just horrific. It was horrific. I just... and. Here I'm with a little baby in my arms, right? And there's this story about 10,000 babies born worldwide with no arms, no legs, internal organ disruption, all sorts of horrible things. And about a third of them were smothered before they ever took a breath. Um, so that was the outrage part. And I thought, okay, this has got to stop. <laughs> and the serendipity part was that... Um, I was uh, graduating in sociology from Vanderbilt, and sociology at that time was a totally dead field. No jobs, no jobs. So I did um, a, sort of a, a useless job search in uh, 78, 79. Uh, Vanderbilt kindly let me stay on a year and teach uh, uh, through 79, 80. And so I went back on the job market, but that year there were advertisements in the sociology bulletin for jobs in business and society. Like, so I ran over to the Vanderbilt Business Library and looked up Keith Davis's textbook and said, shoot, this is just social problems. I can do this. <laughs> <laughs> and I applied to three the three schools that had advertised and got interviews at, at two and an offer from the University of Pittsburgh uh, which was a tough interview because they were just just beginning to hire women and they weren't quite sure we had what it took to be in a business school, you know. Um, and uh, <laughs> But it worked out okay. And I did go to Pitt and had wonderful colleagues there and a good time until the atmosphere turned toxic and then I went to Northern Iowa and took the chair. Uh, so outrage and serendipity, uh, you know, it, it, people think you plan your career, but actually it happens to you. Um, what I wanted to accomplish in those early days, so I started at Pitt in 1980, what I wanted to accomplish was to save the world. I mean, I'm a child of the 60s. What can I tell you? Um, and my expectation was that this probably wasn't going to happen through business because business was evil. Um, so that's how I began this venture. And, of course, um, I had to learn an awful lot about business in the meantime and, and did to spend a lot of time working on it, read Business Week religiously in the Wall Street Journal and so on and so on until I could, um, uh, I could talk to Patter uh, pretty effectively and uh, learned eventually that it's not business that's evil and it's not the people in business that are evil. It's the systems and structures that are in place that provide barriers to good decision-making, to kind decision-making, to beneficial decision-making. 
um, and more about that in a few minutes, uh, too. Um, I think Pitt for uh, Pitt hired at, at that year, they hired four women at once, which was the first time ever. They'd had one woman on the faculty forever and a day, but only one. Uh, this this year, they hired four new ones, and they were really hoping that some of us at least would make it through tenure, and they thought I was a good bet to make it through tenure because I was an honor student and yada, yada, and have a, had a wonderful dissertation and all of that, and was tough in my interview, too, so they figured I could take the heat, you know. Um, I... Uh, was a, probably a good bet for them for an affirmative action hire, uh, but risky because I was discipline trained and not management trained. Uh, and also because I wasn't, they didn't know this, but I knew it, I wasn't well socialized to the professional norms and standards of business schools. I wasn't really quite sure what was expected of a young business school faculty. But that all worked out. <laughs> Um, did my goals and expectations change over time? Oh, of course, absolutely. Uh, goals, in terms of goals, I still wanted to save the world, and I still want to save the world, although I'm a little bit more sanguine about how that might not happen. <laughs> um, and I also uh, have a goal of producing and continuing to produce great scholarship, good scholarship, sound, sound believable, well-documented research. Um, but my expectations about business had shifted, have shifted over now, what, 40 years, um, as I began to realize that many of the people who go into business do so not to cause havoc in the world, but to earn a living for themselves and their families. And many of them go into business thinking this is a really good thing to do, that, that there are many advantages uh, to, to being in business. And that, and I realized also that uh, a good many of them get trapped in those systems and structures that keep them from making good decisions. Uh, that really softened up my attitude about business a whole lot when I realized that we're all human beings together. Um, looking back, um, I would say, uh, uh, um, in, in scholarly terms, I counted up a few weeks ago. I, it just struck me one morning that I should figure out what I had done all these all these years. And I counted up, I think, 15 different areas that I had published research or uh, scholarship in, including things like business history, public policy, regulation, collaborative social problem solving, internal auditing, believe it or not. I did a big study with a colleague on the behavioral dynamics of internal auditing. Um, and international business and society and a whole lot of other things. But I guess my two most significant streams of work have been in corporate social performance and stakeholder theory. Um, corporate social performance, uh, my CSP article in the Academy of Management Review, which was published in 1991, was my answer to 10 years of trying to figure out what this literature in business and society had to say. There were a great many interesting things done uh, and published, uh, many of them books, not, not journal articles for structural reasons. Um, but they, they often talked past each other. They would go off in one direction, and then somebody else would go off in another direction, and there wasn't any, you know, discipline-trained People are used to accumulating work and ideas and citing and, you know, building on what went before and until you get to some viable theory. It wasn't That wasn't happening. Um, I couldn't make sense of it. So the, the CSP paper from 1991 was my attempt to make sense of that field. And what it did was to apply a, a, a systems model to this enormous, vast and disparate literature uh, so that you could see where print structural principles of responsibility come from at various levels. Uh, <clears throat> you could see what kinds of processes happened inside of companies to respond to those uh, those mandates. And then you could also see what kinds of outcomes would happen be given what, the, what companies were doing. Um, that 
piece of work has turned out to be pretty significant in the field. It, it, I think it was one of the focal points for a burst of uh, uh, subsequent activity in theory building and in research, so I'm proud of that. Um, the stakeholder salience, the stakeholder theory work, uh, the most prominent piece that I've done there is a 1997 paper with Mitchell and Agel on stakeholder salience. This was an idea that uh, Ron Mitchell and I apparently co-generated without discussing it with each other <laughs> at one of Max Clarkson's conferences on stakeholder theory in Toronto. It was probably 1995, maybe 94 Around about there. Um, Archie Carroll was at the board at this 30 person conference and he was drawing concentric circles trying to figure out what, what dimensions of stakeholders were relevant. And he started from a central core of, you know, primary and then went to secondary and so forth. And we're looking at this and, and, and everybody's kind of going, mm, well, yeah. What else are we going to, Ron Mitchell went up to the board and said, what if you do it this way? And he drew a matrix. He drew a three circle matrix. Well, that sparked my rational mind. And I was sitting at my Macintosh and at the time and drew my three circles and started labeling them. I said, okay, so if you have power and legitimacy and an urgent claim, those are your three dimensions here. What kind of stakeholder has one of these attributes, two of these attributes, or all three of these attributes. That was the genesis of the stakeholder salience paper. Um, between the two papers, CSP and stakeholder salience, we have gotten around about 20,000 citations. So they, they've gone far and wide, very, very broad. And I'm proud of that, really proud of the work that we did there. Um, Pat asked me to think, too, about what, I might have accomplished for practitioners, and this is harder because I always think about that in terms of consulting, which I hate and have, have done very little of <laughs> because I hate it so much. I don't like to be the fall guy for corporate shenanigans. Um, so I haven't done much consulting, but I have done a lot of teaching, thousands and thousands of students. Um, I've taught in uh, executive MBA programs and international executive MBA programs. So I've had some global exposure as well as uh, as local. And I've published six textbooks, which have reached an even broader audience. So I guess all of that could be useful <laughs> to practitioners. I hope so anyway. Um, let's see. Other than the two streams of work that I'm that I'm really proud of and that have had some significant impact, there are a few other things that I'm proud of about my 40 years in this field. And one is that I'm I'm really proud of figuring out what business and societies had to say. <laughs> I'm really proud of that. I know that sounds odd, but when you're in the in the early days of an emerging field. There's often a lot of confusion and commotion of, about what the field has to offer. And I feel like I finally got it figured out, you know, after 10 years of studying and trying. So I'm, I'm proud of that. Uh, I'm proud of being able to contribute to its advance. Um, I'm really proud of the doctoral students and the, uh, the young faculty that I've been able to nurture and mentor over the years. Uh, and most of them have done really, really well. And, um, gone on to do great things themselves and it seems like that's you know that's that's a contribution to a field that not many people get a, get the uh, the chance to make and I'm grateful for that um, I'm very proud of IABS which is the International Association for Business and Society IABS is a professional organization uh, this is a controversial statement but I'm going to make it because it's really the first time I've ever made it publicly uh, IABS was my creation, my idea, uh, and I was the one who recruited the people who actually made it work <laughs> into the field. So I threw the idea out, and I gathered up the initial founders. Uh, Phil Cochran uh, claims to be the mother and father of IABS, and he is in the sense that he did the actual work. Uh, so Phil and I claim to be father and mother of IABS. Um, IABS now is in its 31st year. It has members from 25 and possibly 30 nations now. 
Uh, it has truly become an international affair. Uh, we're meeting in, in this, this summer, meeting in Lisbon, Portugal. Uh, we've met in Hong Kong. We've met in Sydney. We've met in Victoria. We've met all over the place. So uh, IEBS has truly become uh, a place for research and theory and thinking to be nurtured and sustained and put out there. Um, plus, we took over the journal Business and Society, which has now come to be the premier journal in business and society. Uh, it, it's right on up there with Society for Business Ethics, uh, BEQ, Business Ethics Quarterly. So I'm really proud of that. And I was editor of, of uh, Business and Society for four years in the early early days. So I feel happy that I was able to help build that that uh, that contribution. Um, beyond proud, I'm really, really grateful to have had such an opportunity to be on the ground floor, more or less, of an emerging and building field. You, if you haven't been there, you cannot imagine what a thrill it is to see something building that you're a part of. Um, it's, it's amazing. And I think about if I had had a career in sociology, which is what I was trained to do, I would have been plucking out somebody's, you know, some little piece of somebody else's theory to work on and nothing would have happened that was, that would have been very interesting. Instead, I've had an, a really interesting 40 years, and I'm really grateful for that. Um, the, the big questions that I came into the field with were questions like these. How could people in business make decisions that any sensible person could see were, were going to result in irreparable harm? How could that happen? How could you do this? Of course, I discovered subsequently that most people in business don't do those actions deliberately to cause harm. They do them for quite other reasons, and they don't consider what harms may be uh, resulting. Um, I, I wanted to know, how is it that profit could be more important than people, or more important than the earth? Um, and... On a more personal and institutional level, I wondered, I, I didn't understand why business and society and later business ethics um, could be so ignored and disrespected and maligned in business education. That was, a, that was a real puzzle because it made such sense to me that you would think about um, the consequences of actions to stakeholders, that you would think about the ethics of what you were doing as a manager. And I, I just didn't get why uh, the finance and accounting people hated our guts so much. <laughs> um, of course, I have figured out that it was the, the dominant economic paradigm that uh, drove the business schools uh, that caused all of these behaviors, uh, with the dominant paradigm being narrow in the sense of not encouraging managers to consider stakeholder consequences or harms that would, might result unintentionally. Uh, and also uh, being s narrow enough to, f to to demand that business education be focused on technical uh, technical knowledge rather than broad scale general education, which is more what we were doing at the time. Uh, so those questions uh, we've gotten better at answering those questions. I believe um, we know now that uh, profit is more important than people only within some narrow constraints. Uh, we know that uh, business people often make bad decisions, not because they're bad people, because, but because they are constrained, they're deceived, they're self-deluded, they're uh, focused on a narrow set of goals instead of a broad set of consequences. That gives us a lot to work on. Um, and we know uh, about the effect of the dominant economic paradigm on the nature of business education as well. So we've got all of that pretty well settled out. Um, is there a subject at all? That's my text coming text? in. Okay. I'm sorry, I should have I should have canceled it. Yeah. I don't know how to cancel mine either. Okay. <laughs> Just put it on airplane mode. <laughs> Ready? Okay. Okay. Um, I think there are an awful lot of issues and domains left for us to consider. 
Uh, one that's really important to me is climate change and environmental degradation. Um, I remember from the early 1970s that uh, many people, many of the pundits believed that it was not possible to measure or evaluate environmental harms. Of course, the engineers figured it out. So we know a whole lot about how to do that. Um, and there's a lot more to be done. Climate change is going to drown us all eventually, even though the Lord promised he wouldn't send the flood again. But uh, he's not sending it this time, is he? <laughs> uh, it's coming anyway. It's coming anyway. Uh, the other uh, domain that really bothers me still that we have a lot to, to do about is severe poverty in the world. Um, this is something that concerns me a lot because it is... Inhuman. It's inhuman. Um, uh, For people to be dying young, dying of diseases that are now curable or preventable, uh, uneducated, suppressed, kept down, um, scrambling for their everyday bowl of rice, it's just not not right. It's not right. Uh, And I think business ethics and business and society has a lot to offer uh, to the globe in terms of helping businesses solve the problems of, of severe poverty and also environmental degradation. And there's all sorts of other things, of course. Uh, there's social media, good gracious. The impact of social media on behavior and culture is we don't even understand it yet. I mean, we're starting to analyze and think about it, but we don't really get it yet. Um, we still don't know what how to how to address seriously this do whatever it takes mentality that we run into so often uh, in business decisions that go bad. Um, I've learned in dealing with business people that often that that statement is made in the context of well, of course you're not going to kill people, you know that's sort of given. That's a given. Do whatever it takes, but don't kill anybody. That's the unspoken part. Um, but a young one, I learned from teaching undergrads that young ones don't always understand the dimensions and the boundaries. And they they hear do whatever it takes and they go kill people. It's like, you know, it, oh, well, I thought that's what you told me to do. And you can uh, you, you can ask them, you know, how, if you were in such and such a situation, how would you do? Well, I guess I'd follow orders. You know, that's something we still have to work on. Um and then, of course, we are up against human nature every day of our lives, uh, in ourselves, in our colleagues, in, in our uh, business communities, and in our world. Greed, fear, aggression, self-deception, along with kindness and generosity and intelligence. Um, it's really hard to deal with human nature when you are an academic and you want things to be happening right. Um, Pat asked if... Uh, if I thought that business ethics, doing business ethics, is a new profession. And I would have to say definitely not in terms of content and possibly in terms of institutionalization. Uh, what I mean is uh, all you have to do is read texts from two, three, four thousand years ago and you find many of the same issues arising about human nature and bad decisions and societal constraints and so forth. Uh, so in that in that sense, uh, the content of business ethics is very very old, uh, probably as old as human beings. But institutionalization, in terms of having professional associations and journal outlets and scholarship that's being done and um, um, and so forth, uh, jobs you know, jobs that are called business ethics, that is, I believe, it's a fairly new thing. Um, in um, probably what. When did you all start the Society for Business Ethics in the early 1980s? Uh, so since it, was, it happened along the same um, time frame as business and society's growth, uh, and the institutionalization has been slow but sure, and even more sure for business ethics than it has been for business and society. So let's see. Um, 
What questions about ethics and corporate responsibility have we been able to deal with coherently? My first thought was coherence is pretty much to ask of a field that's so soft like ours is. <laughs> but um, I do think that we have made a, a lot of progress in, for example, delineating from a variety of perspectives how to reason through an ethical problem, an ethical dilemma. We have made progress, as Pat has taught us, in learning to apply moral imagination to ethical dilemmas, ethical problems, ethical situations. Um, we have learned a lot, I believe, about the, the psychological and structural barriers to effective ethical reasoning and how they can be breached, uh, which is, you know, our main problem is breaching those barriers. We've learned a lot about uh, how to incorporate the issues and concerns of stakeholders into business decision making. And in fact, I have to give Ed Freeman uh, kudos and much credit for this because stakeholders are now is now a common it's now common part of the language. You know, it, it, you ask anybody in, in Western civilization and they can tell you pretty much what a stakeholder is. And I believe that was Ed's doing. Um <coughs> Um, I think we have been moderately successful in expanding uh, the reach of business managers' minds in terms of grasping larger dimensions of ethics and business and society relationships. Um, I think we have been able to broaden perspectives so that now it's not considered so stupid to think about what happens to your community if you open or close a factory, for example. Um, it's not considered, you know, out of order to think about um, uh, the harms that are caused by faulty consumer products. Uh, so I think we've done a pretty good job there. Um, and as far as Issues and questions that we need to address, they keep going, they keep going, they keep going. Um, and, um, you know, I've been retired now for seven years and I still keep going. <laughs> so <laughs> all, that, all that I gave up really is the salary and the stupid meetings. <laughs> so that's my story and I'd be happy to answer any questions if anybody out there in the audience has any. How do you see the future of this field? Um, I think the future of business ethics is probably pretty secure. I think the future of business and society has sh has been shown to be a little bit more tenuous. The reason, I believe, is that everybody's an ethicist. And so you can say, oh, I teach business ethics or I do business ethics research and everybody thinks they know what you do, right? And they approve of this. Business and society has this socialist overcast that many people in the capitalist world don't appreciate. And I'm not quite sure why that is, but it, but it's there. And it's one of the reasons why our finance and accounting people hated us for so long. Um, because they thought we were all communists. <laughs> so business and society, I believe, um, it, it may resurrect at some point. Um, I hope that it does because I think it's an extremely valuable part of business education. Um, I'm not sure that it will because the forces against it are powerful, very, very powerful. Uh, business ethics, I think, is going to be secure until it starts focusing more explicitly and more deeply on these really big problems like environment and poverty. Those are the things that businesses really don't want to talk about. Um, and some of our some of our colleagues are in there and pushing on those uh, on those issues. When that gets to be more of the core of the field, I think business ethics is going to find itself in trouble too, because the dominant paradigm is still around, still with us, still kicking. How, can you to back up a bit? And I, I okay. should have asked you this from the very beginning, and it just occurred to me that, that for people who don't know, can you tell, explain the difference between business and society? as a field and business ethics as a field? I will certainly try. Okay. Um, business ethics, as I understand it, is typically based in philosophy. 
Um, most of its practitioners are philosopher, philosopher trained, uh, philosophically trained. Uh, they may be Kantians or Rawlsians or virtue ethics people or utilitarians or who knows what, but they're, they're, they're based in philosophy. Um, that means that they spend a lot of time thinking about reasoning processes and prior uh, you know, assumptions and how you, why you think the way you think and how you come to make decisions. Business and society is much more social science than it is philosophy. Um, although in the early days, in the 1970s and even back into the 60s, um, People who were teaching and working in the area of business and society um, had always had an ethical underpinning. You know, it was always about doing better for society. It was always about making life better for human beings and animals and the, and the earth. Um, but it wasn't. It never rose to the surface as as philosophers will always raise it to the surface. Um, what the social scientists preferred to do was to uh, consider especially in political science and sociology uh, and anthropology, um, they preferred to consider social structures, uh, boundary boundaries and boundary spannings, uh, the pressures that are exerted when groups work together or, or uh, conflict. Um, and from the psychological and sociological or social psychological um, areas of social science, there was much more interest in how the mind works and what kinds of um, what kinds of prior attitudes affect future behavior and what kinds of mental attributes would lead one to do thus and so. So um, I think that the basic difference between the two fields is the foundations in sociology, so, social science uh, for business and society and the foundation of business ethics in philosophy. That's that's the way I see it. And there's this other field coming up now called behavioral business ethics. And I will recall, remember, we were at a conference and Dave Messick did some paper and you took it and destroyed it. <laughs> because you said that it isn't as, because it was a social psychology paper and it just shredded into bits. <laughs> I don't know if you remember that. I do. Um, yeah, Dave, Dave Messick at one of the Ruffin lectures uh, did a, a really um, fine paper from a social psychology perspective uh, where his main point was, I guess I could summarize it like this, his main point was that um, the reason people don't mean to discriminate, they simply mean to hang with their own. <laughs> and it was really he was being pretty forgiving of uh, things like racial discrimination and banking, uh, redlining communities uh, from mortgages and so forth. And I I did rip him up because um the the psychology of discrimination is one thing, but the structural features of discrimination are something else again. Um so if you focus only on how an individual perceives the other, uh, you miss the whole domain of what those parameters are that each of those individuals works works within. Um, and as a sociologist, that's where my eyes are always focused, rather than what the individual is thinking, uh, more about what fences are you running up against, you know, what uh, what what social norms and and pressures and structures, uh, institutions. Are you um, are you up against when you're dealing with something like racism, uh, sexism, any of the other isms, um, and in terms of business behaviors toward those those others? Good, good. I just that. Yeah, that was that was one of my more fun things. <laughs> that, was, that was really quite something. Um, any other questions, Tom? How do you think? Uh, yeah, there's a couple I'd love to ask you if I may. Uh, who, in your opinion, were the greatest influences on your work and the discipline? Who, who were, I'd really love to know who were the consensus builders and who were the kind of catalysts? Ooh, let's see. I think the catalysts would have been people like Keith Davis, uh, Bill Frederick, uh, Archie Carroll to some extent, although he was a little bit 
later in terms of his scholarly impact than those two were. Um, Norm Bowie, of course, but we didn't know the ethicists. The business and society people didn't know the ethicists until Bill Frederick brought those two organizations together, the Social Issues and Management Division of the Academy of Management and the Society for Business Ethics. And I believe that was 1985 when that happened. Uh, and we've been together ever since and hope we always will be. Um, <coughs> so I'm probably not one to answer about the movers and shakers in the philosophical stream. Um, but in business and society, um, Sumner Marcus from the University of Washington was an important figure. Uh, Walter Klein. I mean, there were a bunch of folks in the early days who and they came from other fields. They came from economics. They came from some of them were management trained. Some of them were uh, social scientists. Um, but they came together in terms of wanting to expand the view of managers beyond the economic model and beyond the profit motive to see and understand and incorporate into their decision-making and practices those harms and benefits that might accrue to others outside of their normal frame of reference. So there were a number of folks there. Um, consensus builders, I'll raise my hand. <laughs> I'm not the only one by any means, but I think my uh, CSP paper, the Corporate Social Performance paper from 91, was actually intended to, to be a consensus builder uh, because of all these little, who knows where they came from, streams of work that, that had significance in themselves but didn't ever uh, accrue uh, or didn't ever accumulate. Um, uh, I think uh, Archie Carroll has been a big factor in uh, bringing the field together and emphasizing over and over and over again the importance of social performance for companies and ethical performance for managers. Um, I think, uh, let's see, uh, Bill Frederick, I would have to say, was a leader, in a thought leader. In ter- he was always one jump ahead of everybody else. Uh, so he was, he was writing about social responsiveness before anybody else had thought that was a thing. Um, and he was the one who brought the ethics people into the business and society domain, for which we'll be forever grateful, I think. <laughs> I think. <laughs> Sometimes it looks a little dicey, but we love you. The other yeah. question I'd love to know if you had advice for somebody starting off in the discipline now. I mean, you, you faced some interesting barriers back then. Yeah. Has it changed? If, or, you know, is it the same advice you give to your young self as you give to a young person starting? Not at all. Not at all. Um, I think the the main thing that has, well, both of these fields have now developed to the point where they have some coherent theory. They have historical background. They have a literature. Each of them has a literature. There's a there's a uh, a literature that bridges those the business ethics and business and society. Um, the thing that has really changed is the institutional support for these these fields of study and these uh, activities in terms of teaching. Uh, business and society has been close to driven out of business schools, and that's very very sad. I don't n- know if there's. There might be two doctoral programs left in the United States, and there are several in Europe, uh, possibly some in other places, but those are the ones I know about. Um, and many uh, many of our incoming doctoral students come from other places. They come from Asia. They come from Europe. They come from Australia. Uh, we're beginning to see the occasional one from Africa. Um, so... The institutional structure is such now that the resources are not being poured into this area. In part, I believe that's uh, because of the decades of pounding that we've taken from the economic model people. <clears throat> and in part, it's because the, uh, uh, the accrediting agency has pulled back on its requirement for ethics and social responsibility as part of a business curriculum. Uh, when the AACSB went to the standard of, well, you tell us what you want to accomplish and we'll tell you if you did it or not. 
um, I just I think that was probably the beginning of the end uh, for um, for business schools willingness to pour resources into our fields and without resources being poured into the field where are the new ones going to work I mean you know some of us are retiring and leaving and okay boomer we're leaving um, but that doesn't mean that our jobs are going to be available for the young ones. And it's, I think it's a real tragedy because many of our doctoral students are really, really bright and very, very well trained and educated. And I, I would be really excited to, to watch what, what they come out with over the next 10 or 20 years if they can find and keep a job. Um, the other part of, of that problem is that, um, in America, at least, universities have really gone top-heavy with administrators, and that has soaked up so much in the way of resources that uh, are not being given to faculty. New programs aren't being developed. Old programs are being slashed. Philosophy departments are going by the boards, by the way. They're just philosophy and religion departments are, you know, who cares about that nonsense? Um, and that's the administrative perspective. I've seen it at, at a number of schools. Um, and I think that's also a problem for the young ones. So I would say to the young ones, um, in fact, have been saying to them for 10 years or so now, uh, maybe 15 years, that you can have an emphasis in business ethics or in business and society, but you had better have another discipline uh, of accomplishment that is much more secure in the business school. And this is what the kids are doing now. They're majoring in strategy or they're majoring in organizational behavior or human resources or something else um, with, an, with a focus on business ethics issues or business and society issues. And that seems to be uh, uh, a better way for them to secure jobs and to keep those jobs. And it makes it more difficult, in a sense, for them to publish, though, because those journals... Um, they don't often like to see business ethics type work being submitted to them. <laughs> reviewers will come back and still, I mean, 40 years later, we're still seeing this. The reviewers will come back and say, well, you forgot to cite all this strategy literature. You know, and we're like, oh, well, it's not, we're not really strategy people. <laughs> you know, we have our own literature and we've cited that really well. Um, so I think uh, the word for new scholars is um, mainly to focus on doing the very best work you can do, but get it on out there because the requirements for publishing are harder and harder and harder to meet. Um, and, you know, we would like to see you have a nice 35-year career in, in the field, um, but, and you've got to step up and help us with that. That's terrific. Right. Well, that's terrific. Can I ask one last question? You bet. It's a difficult one. And, uh, I'll, try, I'll try, I'll try. If you're describing something in 20 years' time, you might not even be studying yet or working in this, but how would you portray the current business and society zeitgeist? 2020, what, what, is, what is it like now? Where, where, am, where am I standing? Wherever you want to Back there? Also. Up out there? Uh, you, in this society that we have. Right now, right here, now. here and how now. How would you portray it? The zeitgeist. Well, it depends on whose eyes you're looking out from, doesn't it? Um, from my scholarly eyes, I look out and see that we've come a long, long way, uh, that many of our issues and concerns and research topics have been integrated into other fields and other areas. And that's a good thing and a bad thing. You know, it's a good thing in terms of the subject matter and the content. It's a bad thing for us because, you know, we're not OB and strategy people. We're business and society, business ethics people, and our jobs are going away. So uh, so that's a little bit tough. In, in the broader societal terms, um, I think that, uh, and of course, my perspective is primarily United States. Um, I, I keep abreast of BBC as best I can, but... That's pretty much the only international news I'm ever uh, ever getting. Um, I believe that the the business and society ethics zeitgeist in in America is taking a turn for the worse. 
um, I think uh, we we came through that decade of greed from the 1980s uh, with a couple of nice crashes. We came through uh, the the deregulation era, which is attributed to Ronald Reagan, but actually started long before him. Um, we now have uh, an administration in this country that is, you know, pumping oil into the ocean and killing birds and heaven only knows what else um, on the grounds that uh, business has got to make a profit and these things are just too burdensome. Well, you know, this is what we heard in the 60s and 70s. It's the same old stuff. So um, so I'm pretty alarmed about that. Um, if... Uh, <sighs> If business leaders would step up and say, okay, we, we are going to pay attention to these things no matter what you, the government, do, you know, we'd probably get somewhere. Uh, some have. Some have, and there are pressures that more uh, should go there. Yeah. Um, that's one thing I believe that, that our field has been involved with for quite some time is pushing businesses in that direction, whether or not there's efficient and, and satisfactory regulation. Uh, most of us do not believe that government is the problem. <laughs> most of us believe that government is essential, um, with some variations. Of course, that's a continuum. Um, but given the climate that we have had in this country for the last 40 years or so, um, it's um, it's not going to happen that we have more and more regulation. We're going to have less and less regulation. And that means that we have to emphasize more self-regulation uh, and help businesses understand why it makes sense for them to protect the environment, why it makes sense for them to uh, do the right thing by their employees. Um, it's a harder sell. Uh, it's a harder sell that way. Than, uh, than just encouraging them to comply with the law and regulation. Uh, but I think that's the, that's the trail we've been on for quite some time and we'll probably have to continue to be on. Anything else you want to add? <laughs> I just love it. Um, well, you can, see this, you can see this big grin on my face and that, that should tell you that after 40 years, I still love what we do. Um, I think it's well worth doing. I've had my moments of being on the cliff of despair, which most of us get to eventually in this area. Um, but I always get either get pulled back or gingerly walk back. And, and uh, overall, I think it has been a fantastic way to spend a career. Uh, I think we've done some good. Uh, I think we will do more good. Um, and by that, I mean... Uh, create benefits for people and reduce harms for people. Um, I really believe, like Rodney King said, that we should all just get along. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I believe that our, our two fields, uh, whether merged or separate, uh, are potentially very big contributors to that goal of all of us getting along. <laughs>